Brothers and sisters, I bring you greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. It is so good to be here with you this evening as we gather around the word of the Lord to worship him again on this Lord's day. And if you would please open your hymnal to responsive reading number 672 found in the back of the pew hymnal. Responsive reading 672 was taken from Romans chapter 8. It is divided so that I will read the light print and you can read the bold print. And it speaks about our assurance in Jesus Christ. And one of the great gifts the Holy Spirit works in the heart of a believer is a deepening sense of trust which leads to greater assurance that one belongs to the Lord. And your assurance like mine will be attacked. It will be subject to all sorts of trials over the course of our walk with Jesus. But at the end, deep down inside the heart is a sense of belonging to the Lord that is worked in the believing heart by the agency of the Holy Spirit. So let's look a little bit tonight at our common assurance as believers in Jesus Christ. Reading 672. We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And whom he predestined, these he also called. And whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Just as it is written, for thy sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, Congregation of Jesus Christ, believe these words and go forth to live in peace. Amen. Would you stand and greet your brothers and sisters in Jesus' name at this time?
Heavenly Father, as we sing these songs of praise tonight, we sing them to you through your Son. And we sing them to you, O Jesus, Son of the Father's love. And we do so, Holy Spirit, in the power and strength that you provide, Jesus believing people. And so we pray tonight, Holy Spirit, that you would give us a certain measure of grace to worship you, to pray to you, to receive your word, and to receive the life transforming truth of the gospel in our hearts once again tonight. Fit us, equip us. Prepare us to live this week in light of your coming. Help us like all creation to stand on our tiptoes, waiting and groaning and longing for your return. But until that day, may, be, may we be found serving you in the ways and with the skills and time and talents you give us. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus, amen. You may be seated this evening, and at this time, we will continue our journey through the Westminster Confession of Faith, that wonderful shorter catechism of the Presbyterian Church, but it certainly belongs to the whole Church of Jesus Christ. What is adoption? Adoption is an act of God's free grace whereby we are received into the number and have a right to all the privileges of the sons of God. What is sanctification? Sanctification is the work of God's free grace whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God and are enabled more and more to die unto sin and live into righteousness. Amen. I hope when you read that last little piece, more and more die unto sin and live into righteousness. What comes to your mind is what Jesus taught us this morning, that you will live in freedom, a progressive, real, spiritual freedom that, that enters the heart at salvation, but continues to grow within us as we, not simply age biologically, but as we age spiritually, more and more of our heart is set free in Jesus and for Jesus. And so with that tonight, brothers and sisters, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, when we sing these words, while we are waiting, come. And other words of great hymns and songs of the faith. We want you to know that we really do believe we're singing them into your ears and not simply into the air. We believe, Jesus, that you hear everything we sing and say. In fact, your great servant, King David, in Psalm 139 once said, before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. So you know the song before we sing it. You know the words before we say them. And yet we sing them and we say them because we've never experienced them before. And you receive them with much delight and gladness in your own heart. O Son of God, we love you. We love you tonight, Lord Jesus, because you first loved us. It is your dying love on the cross, your resurrection love on the third day that draws us into your heart by the Spirit of heaven. And we thank you tonight that you are uniting men, women, and children, boys and girls from every tribe and language and tongue and nation across the earth this very day. For this has been the Christian Sabbath day and still is for many of us. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that around the world, worship services took place in jungles, in jails, in storefronts, in homes, in grand cathedrals, and in lowly tents. 
and in motel rooms, wherever sanctuaries were open and doors unlocked, wherever people could meet down by the river or in the privacy of some nook out of the way due to the illegal worship of God where they live. It went up to you, this worship, O God. It ascended to heaven in spirit and in truth. The gospel went forth and people heard about the life, death, and resurrection of your son. And Lord God, you saved thousands of souls today. Lord, we thank you that every day you are building your church. And as so much happens on the Lord's day, may so much more happen over the next six days of this world's history. We're thinking of Monday, which will be starting soon in parts of this world, oh God. We're praying that on the, on the job and in the workplace, in the marketplace of this world, in city halls, in schools, in neighborhoods, as people are walking their dogs or grocery shopping or at gas stations, wherever people are meeting and intersecting, we pray that Christians would live out their Christian life. We pray that we would be salt in the midst of a decaying world and be some kind of preservative, Lord Jesus. We pray that we would be light in the midst of a dark world and that we would shine the light of Jesus Christ. And for some of us, that means we have to be a little bolder than we normally are. For some of us, that means we need to be a little wiser about how we spend our conversational time than we do. Lord Jesus, the time is short. As we will hear in a moment, you are coming like a thief in the night. And we want to be prepared, of course, but we want to prepare as many people as we can for that great day of God Almighty. And Lord, that day for us may come in our lifetime, but it may come in another sense, if you call us home before your return. Either way, Lord Jesus, we know the great truth of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5. To be away from the body is to be at home with the Lord. Paul says elsewhere in Philippians 1.21, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If it is to be life in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in faith. In other words, your great apostle, that apostle to the Gentiles, that man who was struck down with blindness on the Damascus road and heard your voice, that Saul turned Paul, whose scales fell from his eyes when Ananias prayed for him, O Lord. That very Paul is saying, I could flip a coin right now. I would prefer to be with you, Jesus, but there are people on earth who need my faith and need my discipleship strength. And Lord, may it be the same for all of us. May it be a toss-up. We want to be with you, Jesus. We want to see you face to face, and everything else will fade away. But yet until that time, we want to be found Blessing people, loving people, serving people, giving to the kingdom of God, storing up treasures in heaven, not on earth, praying for your kingdom to come and your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. We want to be found busy in our master's service all the way until our 60s, our 70s, our 80s, our 90s, even on that deathbed, blessing the staff, blessing the doctors, blessing the counselors, the nurses, whoever may be attending us at that point in time. Lord, we want to be pricked and bleed Bibline. We want Bible truth, Bible hope, Bible heaven, Bible forgiveness, Bible love, Bible grace, Bible mercy to flow from our hearts 
hearts and our lives. Consecrate us, God, until you take us home. And when our service is done, when our long day on earth is over, when our bodies are weak and frail, when our heart begins to give out or our mind begins to lose its capacities, oh God, then take us home. But if you choose to take us home earlier in the prime of life, when our loved ones still want to be by our feet and around our family table, as much as we want to live a long life, we will submit to that disease if we have to, O oh Lord. We will go home when you call us home, O oh Jesus. But until that time, we flip to the other side of the coin and we say, God, keep us active in your service. As Paul says, we have so much to live for, but everything to die for. Oh, Jesus, magnificent Jesus, we inhale your love. We exhale our praise. We inhale your mercies, and we exhale our thanksgivings. Your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for being so tender and kind to us. The truth of the matter is, Jesus, all our days are written in your book before one of them came to be. We just want to live out our purpose. We want to be like Paul in Acts 20, verse 24, who says, I do not count my life of any value to myself. If only I might finish my course, the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the good news of God's grace. Everyone in this auditorium tonight has a course. Everybody here has been given a race to run for you. How are we doing, Lord? Search my heart. Show me my my faults. Show me my shortcomings. Show me where I sin and I don't see the sin. Show me where I commit iniquity and I do so intentionally. Show me what I must confess that I might be quick to confess. Show me where I need to change that I might be quick to change. Oh Lord, thank you so much for being the Lord of glory. Thank you tonight for the forgiveness of our sins. And as we stand up to sing this next hymn in preparation, Lord Jesus, to hear about your bowls of wrath, may you give us more courage in this hour of human history and in this hour of our life. Courage does not come from human nature. Courage comes from Jesus Christ. And we want you to embolden us. We want you to empower us. We want you to do what our nature cannot do. We want you to do what our selfishness won't allow us to do. We want you to put your hand upon us and overcome us and lead us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. In your name we pray, amen. Brothers and sisters, stand up. Stand up for Jesus.
Amen. Amen. This day, the noise of battle. The next day, the victor's song. Imagine that. Can you see your life tonight as simply a day? You're here for a day, and tomorrow you go home to be with the Lord forever. Thomas Watson, that great Puritan author and preacher of yesteryear, once said to his flock one Sunday morning or one Sunday night, Brothers and sisters, see yourself staying on this earth as though you're staying a night or two in the inn, and then you go home. Imagine that. So you're here, I'm here for a, a night or two to, to breathe God's air, to live the life he calls us to live, and to point as many people we can by our life and our example and our words and our deeds to Jesus. And then he'll say, good job, come on home. What a wonderful thought that is. I know you can't wait for that, and I can't wait for that either. But we can certainly wait on Jesus to come and speak to us tonight, for he has a, a word from us from the book of Revelation, chapter 16, verses 12 through 16. I encourage you to open your Bible and to follow along as we're making our way through this incredible final book of the Holy Bible, filled with symbols and allusions to the Old Testament. It is really a, a book written to suffering Christians who were going through hard times. And this is written to encourage Christians going through hard times. It's really a book of hope, a book of comfort, solace, and consolation for the church of Jesus Christ. It's not about detecting what's happening today, tomorrow, and the next day, although that's part of it. The big, great truth of Revelation is Jesus Christ is returning, and he will vanquish the foe in, the, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And so this is sort of that great ending story of the Bible, which really tells the whole Bible story in 22 chapters, and then brings us to the very end of human history and the eternal kingdom of God. And so with that, let me read verses 12 through 16 tonight, and then we will pray. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs. For they are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, as we come to your sacred text once again, we humble ourselves and we take our sandals off at the foot of of this great mountain of truth. For you are a holy God, and we are unholy in ourselves. And we pray tonight, Lord, that we would hear of your redeeming love, of your grace and mercy in the midst of this moment in human history. And as we come to the edge of time 
and to the beginning of that eternal day. We ask you, O oh Lord, to speak to our minds and hearts the great truth of this passage. In Jesus' matchless name we pray, amen. Tonight, we come to Armageddon and the great day of God. That alone should make your heart stir and your knees tremble. This is one of those great passages in Scripture that all of human history is pointing toward. And tonight, you and I have the privilege of hearing the Lord teach us what this day of Armageddon and this day of God represents. Chapters 15 and 16, let me remind you, form the fifth vision cycle or review scene of the revelation of Jesus Christ. In chapter 15, we were introduced to the seven bowls of wrath. And then we were led to the sea of glass like crystal. And we heard the song of the redeemed from all ages worshiping Christ. And then we heard about the preparation for the bowls of wrath as, as the seven angels were each given their particular bowl. And then we came into chapter 16. And in this chapter, bowl after bowl is poured out upon the whole earth, symbolizing the ongoing judgments and wrath of God until the return of Jesus Christ. We heard that wonderful interlude after the first three angels poured out their bowls, an interlude by the angel and those around the altar saying, Lord, your judgments are true and just. And last Sunday, we looked at bowls four and five how the fourth angel poured his bowl on the sun and it scorched people with fire, and how the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and the kingdom of Satan was plunged into darkness and how people bit their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sores. And even then they did not repent of their deeds. You... You now know from our study that the first bowls, one through five, that set of bowls of wrath, comprise the judgment of God upon the wicked throughout this gospel age leading to the end of the age. And we've unfolded that in detail. But now we come to bowls six and seven. Tonight, Bowl 6. Next Sunday night, Lord willing, Bowl 7. If the first five bowls of God's wrath have primary reference to the gospel age, there is no question tonight, friends, that this sixth and next week's seventh bowl bring us to the end of time. And so what you are going to hear tonight are some details, and once again, the big picture of what will happen at the end of days. So let's begin tonight with bowl 6 in verses 12 through 16. The main thought of 12 through 16 is this. Bowl 6 is poured out at the end end of this gospel age, where the other bowls have been poured out during this gospel age. So we're brought to the end of the age, and only God knows when that is. And let me walk you now, slowly, through these coming great moments in history. And let's spend some time tonight learning how 
these teachings in verses 12 through 16 align with the teachings of Jesus on his end time discourse and with the teachings of Paul who also talks to us about the end time realities. Let's begin together. Bowl six is poured out at the end of the age, the end of the gospel age, beginning with verse 12. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Verse 12 is teaching, beloved, that bowl six is poured out on the Euphrates River. Bowl one was poured out on the earth, bowl two on the seas, bowl three on the springs of water and fresh waters around the world, bowl, bowl four on the sun, bowl five on the throne of the beast, bowl six is now poured out on the great River Euphrates. And I will share with you in a moment that this is a symbolic phrase, a symbolic truth, and you have to get the symbol behind the Old Testament reality in this New Testament time. The Euphrates River was the dividing line in Old Testament Israel between her and her enemies. On the other side of the Euphrates were the enemies of Israel. On the west side of the Euphrates and south was the nation of Israel. In fact, during the first century, when John wrote this, the Euphrates River was also the boundary line of the Roman Empire. Here, the Euphrates symbolizes the beast's world kingdom and all the unbelievers under his sway who are ready to make war against God and his people. In other words, when you read that the bowl is poured out on the great river Euphrates, well, what does the bowl do? The bowl dries up the water of the river, symbolizing no more barrier no more boundary between Israel and her enemies. The boundary is dried up, which means the enemies can now proceed and attack Israel, or in our case, the church. The great river is dried up, and it's a figure of speech in New Testament times, meaning there's no barrier holding God's enemies back from his people. The barrier is gone. The barrier is erased. And this prepares, notice, ways for the eastern kings and their armies who are enemies of God to proceed with their attack. Bowl 6 reminds us that the spiritual warfare is very real. First of all, the spiritual warfare is very real during this gospel age. Remember Revelation 12, verse 12? Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. So the devil has been cast out of heaven. He is now on this earth. He knows that his time is short. And Satan desires to rule over a unified world order. And he intends to do so through his sea beast and his earth beast. We've covered this in chapter 13 at length. But Right now, in this gospel age, he cannot rule over a unified world order because he is now bound. And he is bound, as we will learn from Revelation 20, for a thousand years. And the number thousand isn't a literal 
a thousand years. It is symbolical of the whole gospel age between the first and second comings of our Lord Jesus Christ. Which means right now that Satan is bound, that he cannot deceive the nations like he did before the coming of Christ. Before the coming of Christ, the nations were in darkness and greatly deceived. With the advent of Jesus Christ, a dying and rising from the dead and ascending into heaven, Satan was cast out of heaven, no more to return to heaven to accuse the brothers of their sin or the sisters, because Christ is seated on his throne. Though Satan is now bound for a thousand years in the sense of not being able to deceive the nations while the gospel goes out and churches are planted and missionaries are sent. He is still able to do much damage in this world. For instance, Ephesians 2.2 tells us that he is the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. People who are disobeying Christ and disobeying God are being worked over by the prince of the power of the air. We are told in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, that he's also the God of this world who has blinded the minds of unbelievers. And we're also told in 1 Peter 5, 8, that he is our adversary, the devil, who prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So when we say that Satan is bound, you have to use your symbolical mind to understand he's bound from one thing, deceiving the nations about the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why the gospel is going out to all the nations. That's why Jesus said before he ascended, go and make disciples of all nations. Get at it. Because at this time, Satan's not going to stop that effort. There'll be strongholds and battles to be won, no doubt. But the gospel is going to reach the nations. But then Satan will be released. And we'll get to that in just a moment. So during this gospel age, Satan has desires to rule the entire world and bring it all together as a force against the Lord Jesus and his church. But he cannot succeed during the gospel age. But in this final season of history, there's going to be a massive change. Revelation 20, if you just turn a couple pages ahead. And this you must understand, and we'll get to it in detail in a few months. But for now, let me read beginning with verse 7. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle... Their number is like the sand of the sea, and they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. It appears that the release of Satan at the end of history and this sixth bowl refer to the same moment in history. If so, at that time, we will see a vast network of evil spiritual forces coming together, causing the nations and the people of the earth to stand against Christianity. So where Christianity is legal now in many places across the earth, there will come a time where it is illegal everywhere on earth. They will eventually extinguish Christ's lampstand on earth, his church. Luke 21, 35 says, For it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the whole earth, this earth beast and sea beast coming together under the leadership of Satan. In fact, we covered this in Revelation 11, verses 7 and 8. And when they have finished their testimony, that is, when the church has finished her testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them, and their bodies will lie in the street of the great city. This, as you know, is referring to the great tribulation at the end of time where Christianity will be criminalized, 
Christians will be on the run and hiding with nowhere to go, but we will not take the 666 mark because we are marked on the forehead and our right hand by God Almighty through the Holy Spirit. So we've covered some of this in earlier sessions, but verse 12 is simply telling you that the bowl will be poured out symbolically on the river Euphrates and the water's dried up. That's just a, a figurative way of saying at the end of time, God's going to pull back, Satan's going to be released, and he's going to marshal the earth together against Christianity, against God. That's what you want to know. In fact, uh, the notion of God uh, drying up uh, the rivers in the waters in the Old Testament is found in a number of places. And what's going to be so fascinating about this is that as Satan misleads the world as they're there going to attack Christians in the church, which they will, there'll be suddenly a reversal, just like there was in the book of Esther. Christ will return, and he will win the victory. That's what you must keep in mind. But let's go to verse 13 now. If, if verse or verse 12 is how bowl 6 is poured out on the Euphrates River. In verse 13, John sees three wicked enemies attacking Christ's church. And these three wicked enemies are part of this end time war against God. Verse 13. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs. And so John sees these three wicked enemies attacking Christ's church. It's an incredible sight, really. It's, it's a vision. He's in a trance-like state. He's caught up in the Holy Spirit. But this is what his mind sees. Three unclean spirits leap like frogs out of the mouths of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Now, this is an incredible picture, and you want to grasp what's going on here. We learned about this unholy trinity, this unholy alliance earlier, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Let me remind you of this. In Revelation 12, 17, we read, Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, and he stood on the sand of the sea, and he was surveying the whole world and plotting what his next steps would be. The dragon, of course, in Revelation 12, refers to the devil or Satan, the ancient serpent against God and his people. In Revelation 13, 1, we learned about the sea beast, which says, and I saw a beast rising out of the sea. And in Revelation 13, 11, we read, then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. Well, we're coming back to those beasts again here in chapter 16, but with greater detail. The dragon represents Satan. The sea beast represents the anti-God, the anti-Christian world system and all the peoples of the earth. And the beast from the earth represents false religions and ultimately the false prophet who appears at the end of time. You'll notice that they, they had these unclean spirits like frogs coming out of each of their mouths. Why frogs, by the way? Well, you may remember that that was the second plague in Egypt. You might also know that to the Jews, according to Leviticus, frogs are considered unclean. The idea here is filth. The idea here is stench. It is symbolic of Satan's evil, filthy empire that these demonic spirits look like frogs to John as he sees the vision. In fact, one commentator says that frogs are slippery and they have very slick skin and Satan himself is very slippery and very slick in all of his deceptions and lies. This, this 
this profuse outpouring of spirits, of course, will be dynamic and full at the end of time. But keep in mind, what you're reading in verse 13 happens to some degree all through the gospel age. That demons are being used by Satan to further his filthy, unclean empire. This is why you see some things in this world and you just pull out your hair and say, how can anybody do that? Or how can anybody think like that? Or how can anybody practice like that? Or why would anybody do that? Keep in mind the demonic world is behind it. The prince of the power of the air, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers. So both six friends reminds us of Christ's three wicked enemies. They are in every generation. The dragon or Satan is at work uh, through the sea beast or the anti-Christian world, creating and stirring up antagonism against Christians who are supposed to be the most loving and kind people on earth. And you may say to yourself, how could somebody ever, never, or how could somebody ever uh, hate us and not love us? Well, it's demonic. Behind the hatred is demonic influences against the church using the fallen nature of humanity. And then we see false religions and all of this leading up to the final battle led by the false prophet of Satan. Christ's church is always under attack. And that's why, listen to this, friends, for a moment. This is why it is so important for you who are growing and mature Christians, to be constant in prayer, constant in and faithful to the Word, and constantly worshiping God. Because if you are walking in a spirit of prayer, if you are walking in compliance with the Word of the Lord and learning God's truth, and if you are constantly worshiping the Lord in your heart and in your spirit, you are protected from deception. Demons have nothing to do with you because you're so full of Jesus Christ. And when they attack you, you know exactly what's happening. It's a clear sign. Sometime I'll tell you of some, some stories I went through some years ago when I was under great demonic attack as a pastor and things I saw in the spiritual realm that I can not even put into words. But by that time in my life, when God allowed that attack to happen, I had a certain level of Bible knowledge in my mind. And when these attacks would assail me, all I had to do was go to the Word of God, and I learned something powerful in that moment. The moment you start reciting or reading the Scriptures, demons flee. They cannot stand in the presence of God. Because you're calling on the light of heaven. And when the light of heaven is filling your mind and your heart, they'll go elsewhere. They'll go through waterless places looking for another body to inhabit because they can't inhabit yours. Because you are filled with the Holy Spirit. They'll try to oppress you, no doubt. But you belong to God and God's Holy Spirit. So pray. Be a man or woman of prayer. Be a man or woman of the word. And be a man or woman of worship. And as you're worshiping God, uh, the heavenlies are opening. You're entering into the very portal of the throne room of heaven itself. There's a clear line between you and God the Father. And you just keep praying to the Lord. And that's why I keep calling our church to pray on Wednesday nights. And if you can't join us on Wednesday night, pray for this congregation all the time. Because Satan wants nothing better than divide congregations. And to cause hassles. And to lead leaders of congregations, elders and deacons and pastors and Sunday school teachers into immoral types of thoughts and behaviors. Because he knows that if he can get the leaders, he knows he can take the church. So this will intensify globally toward the end. And when this happens, Christians will say to themselves, all hell is breaking loose. 
you'll see what it is. And you'll see it for what it is. Verse 14. In verse 14, God explains that the frogs symbolize demonic spirits. Let's look at this a little bit more. Verse 14, he goes, For they are, that is, the the frog-like spirits, for they are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. So now we learn that the chief teaching of verse 13 brings us right to the end of the age because these demonic spirits will be released on the earth and they'll go abroad, notice, to the kings of the whole world. Why does he say to the kings of the whole world? He says this because the kings of the whole world, those leading society, leading the nations, leading the effort, will then pass down the lies to the citizens of the nations. So you get the leaders, and then the leaders will propagate the lies that the citizens will buy or be enforced to follow. And so when these demonic spirits performing signs go abroad to the kings of the whole world, they will assemble them for battle. At this time, Satan has been released And the whole world is being assembled for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. Now, let's think about this for a moment. The first thing you need to know is Satan's host of demons or unclean spirits are already released on the earth right now. We learned this from Revelation 9, verses 2 and 3. It was one of the the trumpets. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft of the bottomless pit rose smoke, like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, symbolizing demons, and they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. So the earth is filled with demons, following their commander-in-chief. And these unclean spirits now perform signs at the end of the age to bring together the kings of the world for the great day of the Lord. I already mentioned a moment ago, they pass on their lies. That's what, that's what the kings, that's what the leaders of world nations do who do not have God. They pass on their lies to the citizens of their countries, close quote. One commentator I read says this. This is, this is really interesting. Listen, he says, it is not the hard power of legions, of armies, and armor that Christians should fear. Far more dangerous is the soft power of speech, language, and propaganda. Very interesting, isn't it? That's what you need to put your antennas up to hear. It's not the bombs and the bullets as much as it is the soft power of speech and language and propaganda that misleads the masses. This happens in every generation, and it succeeds in part because this is a fallen world. But Satan is bound in this gospel age, and during this time, he can't bring the whole world together in one unified effort. It won't, can't happen right now. But eventually, the global world will finally come together once Satan is released and the demonic hordes are sent on their ambitious mission to gather the nations of the earth on the great day of God the Almighty. Now, you know when it says here they perform signs and they go abroad to the whole world to assemble them? Well, how do they do this? Well, listen. The whole idea of these demons coming out of the mouths of the dragon, the false prophet and the beast, speaks of one main thing, just a a torrent of lies. Coming from the mouth of Satan, the father of lies, a torrent of lies, a rush of deception across the earth to keep people spiritually blind at the end of time. You're going to see massive deception. You will see through it, but multitudes of humanity 
will be taken in by it. But not everyone. We're going to learn in chapter 17 that even the world itself at the end will turn against each other in some pretty unique ways, powerful ways. They, they deceive people. But notice what it's called here. I want you to see that the great day of God the Almighty. This is one of the choicest statements of the coming of Jesus Christ in the Bible. The great day of God the Almighty. Why is it called the great day of God the Almighty? It's God's great day of victory. That's what it is over his enemies and our enemies. It is triumph for Christ and his church. God in Christ returns to judge the unbelieving world and to destroy the earth. God in Christ comes to set up his eternal reign. Hallelujah. And so Bull 6 teaches that God permits demonic spirits to unite the world in its opposition against Christ and his church. All the nations of the earth under the banner of a one world government, a one world order. During that time, as I mentioned, there will be the great tribulation. Mark 13, 14 says from Jesus, but when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, flee, verses 19 and 20. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of creation that God created until now and never will be. So just know that this is coming. Some people think it was the destruction of Rome in 70 AD, but that does not fill up the expressions of the Bible on the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I had one, one dear member at one of my churches who, who believed that or was wondering about it and said, Mike, do you think it's possible that Jesus came back in 70 AD? And I go, well, on the one hand, he did. He came back and he, he used the Romans to judge the nation of Israel. But that's not his glorious return. Titus, Titus 2.13 says that we're awaiting our blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, and every eye will see him when he returns. So Christ has not returned yet to judge the living and the dead. Maybe some of you wonder about that. Let me just make it clear. Christ has not yet come in that way to judge the living and the dead. There, the earth will be in turmoil according to Luke 21, 25 and 26. And there will be signs in the sun and moon and stars and on the earth, distress of nations and perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves, people fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. Now, don't for a moment think that when we get to the end of time and the whole world is marshalling itself up against the church of Jesus Christ throughout the earth, that every single person is totally anti-Christian and anti-God. They're not believing in Jesus, and they're not believing in the one true God. So in that sense, they are. But they're going to be, a lot of people are going to be seeing what's going on here. What have I gotten myself into? Can I get out now? I don't side with what this world is doing against the Christian church. No doubt that'll be part of the situation. But what's next after all this? Luke 21, 28. Now when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Well, friends, the great day of God Almighty is, is the victory of God. And I'll share it in a moment, but I, want, I can't wait. I want to share it now. <laughs> uh, the great day of God the Almighty and the great battle of Armageddon, it's over in a moment. It's not some long, drawn-out escapade. It ends the moment Christ comes. He is the decisive victor. It's not in the balance, ever. So, let's go to verse 15 now. 15, we've got two more verses to go. In verse 15, Jesus Christ shares with this church now a great warning and a great encouragement. So, we've just spoken about these demons who are going to get the whole world assembled against the church of Jesus Christ for battle. And they think that they're going to, at least their kings do, 
destroy Christianity completely. And they will. Of course, our dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city as we've learned and all of that. But in verse 15, Jesus says, Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. Well, here is a warning and an encouragement from Jesus. First of all, we hear Christ's great warning. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Now, that was part of Jesus' ministry, to warn people that he's going to come back a second time like a thief. But Jesus is, is by no means the only one to say that. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 and 2, Now concerning the times and seasons, brothers, you have not need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Remember, thief in the night. That is not to scare Christians, because Paul goes on to say, for us the return of Jesus is not like a thief in the night, because we know he's coming, we know we're forgiving, forgiven, and we're going to be with him forever. He comes like a thief for those who are unprepared, for unbelievers. Suddenly, without warning, says the Bible. In Matthew 24, verse 40 through 44, Jesus talks about it in this way. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief, says Jesus, was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. And in Revelation 3, 3, we already read it here some time ago. Remember, says Jesus, what you received and heard. Keep it and repent if you will not wake up. In other words, if you're not a true Christian, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. And so Jesus and Paul, and John, and the Bible tell us tonight with a great warning. He's coming like a thief, and the moment he does, all opportunity for salvation is lost. But now we hear his great encouragement. Blessed. The blessed follows the behold. The behold is the warning. The blessed is the encouragement. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be, may be seen exposed. The one who stays awake, the one who is alert, the one who is dressed, the one who is prepared, the one who is living for Christ, the one who is holy and righteous and true, the one who is praying, the one who is worshiping, the one who is in the Word, the one who is repenting of his or her sins, that one has their garments on. It's another figure of speech. It's not saying to have physical clothing on. He's saying to have the spiritual fruit of the Spirit in your life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Be ready. Be prepared. And notice he's saying this to professing Christians. He's speaking to his church. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. Why doesn't Jesus just say something like this? You're elect, once saved, always saved. I'll never leave you or forsake you. Why is he saying that? This, because he knows that within his church, his gathered people, there are false Christians false professors of faith. And this is a last warning to those who've heard the gospel and intellectually believed to actually bring it into their heart and make sure that they are living for Christ. No matter what anybody says to you, if they're living 10, 20, 30, 40 years against the word of God, their clothing is not on and they will be found naked spiritually and exposed. And so Jesus gives us this great warning and this great encouragement to stay dressed and ready like the five virgins in the parable he told 
whose, whose wicks were trimmed and burning, waiting for the groom to come. And the others had five uh, candles go out and their wicks were no longer burning. And they said, here, give us some of your light. And they said, no, we can't give you our candles. Go and buy some before the master comes. So the five go and they're trying to get light and for their candles and oil for their candles. But it's too late. While they're gone getting oil for their candles, the bridegroom came and the door was shut. That's exactly what he's saying here. You can't borrow somebody else's salvation oil in your heart. It has to be your own oil burning. It can't be mommy or daddy's oil burning. And if you go to look for that salvation oil too late, the bridegroom may come and the door is shut on you forever. In Matthew 24, 45 through 51, Jesus talks about being ready. In Mark 13, 32 through 37, Jesus talks about being ready. It's everywhere. Don't you just read the New Testament Gospels and your heart thump, thump, thump. It's like, it's ready. He's coming. He's at the door. It could be in my lifetime. It could be this week. It could be whenever. That's what Jesus wants you to have. This, friends, this great encouragement and this great warning of Jesus is exactly what the church needs right now in America. There are so many Christians turning away from true doctrine and biblical teaching, denying so much of what the church has taught for centuries. I say to you tonight, don't stray. Stay ready. Make sure you are born again that you are born of the Holy Spirit, that you are saved, and that your garments are on and you're living a holy life. It's exactly also what the world needs right now. You see, some people come to faith in Jesus Christ by hearing of amazing grace. Some people come to faith in Christ by hearing of the judgment to come. People come to Christ in all sorts of different ways. This verse... 15, I'm coming like a thief, can be used to save someone you know tonight, by the way. You don't always have to use John 3, 16. Some people have heard about the love of God so much that they don't want to hear it anymore. But the arrow of salvation to their soul may be this. Christ is coming like a thief. And if you miss it, it's over. Well, let's, let's move on to our final thought tonight. In verse 16, let's read this. And they assembled them. Now we're back to the demonic spirits. And they assembled the kings. They assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. In verse 16, we see the devil take his final stand at the place called Armageddon. Satan, the false prophet, and the sea beast have now assembled a one world order. He's been released. Some time has passed. The nations of the earth have had time to, to change their attitudes toward religion and Christianity. Leaders are forming a government, a world order, a system. Who knows how that might come about? We have all sorts of ideas and speculation. And they've assembled this one world order against God the Almighty and against Christ and His church. And they are symbolically assembled at a place called Armageddon. So Armageddon is a symbol it's not a literal place on earth like some of our dear brothers and sisters would have us believe. Armageddon, we are told in Hebrew. In Hebrew, it, it's, it's Megiddo. Uh, the Mount Megiddo or the city of Megiddo. Megiddo wasn't a mountain in the old... It was a, a plain. It was near a big plain or large open space and many battles were fought there and God won the battle with Deborah and uh, 
the Old Testament book of Judges. One commentator said, the attempt to locate Armageddon with precision is a fruitless enterprise. Nobody can identify it today. Scholars, everybody has ideas, but there's no, con there's no consensus at all on this. I follow the line of thinking of many good commentators who say place names like Babylon, Euphrates, and Armageddon do not refer to specific geographical places, but the whole world. The battles in Israel associated with Megiddo and the nearby mountain become typological symbol of the last battle against the saints in Christ which occurs throughout the whole earth. And, and we learn this in Revelation 20, where it says that the whole world circles the camp, the beloved camp. That's Christianity. That's just a figure of speech saying that wherever Christians live on the face of the earth, the whole world will be against them. So don't look for a certain battle in a certain place, in a certain desert, at one place on this earth. That's not what it means. So let me try, try to help you understand this a little bit more and we'll be done. The idea in verse 16 is the whole world now surrounds the church. In chapter 20, verse 9, we read this. And they marched up over the broad place of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. Now that's a figure of speech. It simply means the whole world surrounded. Wherever you look, north, south, east, and west, wherever you live, Africa, United States, Chile, Peru, uh, Russia, Ukraine, Europe, any continent, surrounded in the final moment of human history. So Bowl 6 brings us right up to the final battle. The final battle hasn't taken place yet, but everything's ready for it. At the end of the gospel age, and it's all about Armageddon. So let me give you a couple of thoughts about Armageddon. There's Armageddon Major and Armageddon Minor. What's Armageddon Major? Armageddon Major is the end time battle of Armageddon. And it is ultimately Christ's return. When Christ returns to judge the living and the dead, as we say in the Apostles' Creed, the whole world surrounding the church of Jesus Christ is immediately judged. And the war is over before it even starts. Someone should say amen to that. Amen. It's not a world war among nations. Let me say that again. Armageddon is not a world war among nations. With nuclear bombs going off everywhere and the world being destroyed. It's not a war among nations but a global battle and assault against Christians who love God and pray for their enemies to their last breath. It's not a political war. It's not an economic war. It's not about guns. It's not about bombs. Armageddon is the place in time and history where the world has criminalized Christianity, made it illegal to follow Christ at the end of time. So wherever you live on planet Earth, you're a threat to the new world order because you will not receive the mark. And all of a sudden, when times are most extreme for Christians in the church, Christ returns to judge the living and the dead. The battle is over. That is Armageddon. You know, in fact, it's beautiful. If you want to check, this is, I can't leave you without Revelation 20 one more time. Uh, verses uh, 9 and 10. You want to know how, how long the battle is going to last? I mean, it's been 2,000 years and counting. But notice this. And they marched up, I read this a moment ago, over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints, a figure of speech, surrounded the church of Jesus Christ throughout the world and the beloved city. And then here it is. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. That's the return of Jesus. That's it. So the world thinks it's about to have its, its paradise on earth because Christians are eliminated. 
But just the reverse occurs. Christ returns. Christians are caught up to be with the Lord. And the fires of judgment are poured out. And the devil, verse 10, who had deceived them, was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's Armageddon Major. There's a sense in which Armageddon Minor is throughout the gospel age. It's the spiritual battle always going on against the church of Jesus Christ. Whenever a group of people, now listen, whenever a group of people, whenever a government, whenever another religion or whenever Christians are kind of surrounded and marginalized and minorities and they're being persecuted for their faith. That's a minor Armageddon in the sense that it's a preview of the worldwide episode that is to come in the future. And that goes on between the two comings of Christ until Armageddon major happens at the end. So on one level, anywhere, and any time the state or its people persecute Christians, you have a glimpse of the final Armageddon at the end of time. Christ is coming like a thief. Stay in the faith. I close with these simple words from Jesus. Mark 13, 33. Be on guard. Keep awake. For you do not know when the time will come. Mark 13, 35. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster suddenly crows, or in the morning. In Mark 13, 37, and what I say, I say to all, stay awake. Amen. Jesus, help us to stay awake. Help us to stay spiritually awake to follow you in spirit and in truth. Thank you so much tonight for teaching us about this sixth bowl. It's overwhelming, Lord, to consider it. And we pray that we would grasp the big truth that on the great day of God Almighty, you will come and you will rescue your persecuted church and then you will judge the living and the dead. Oh, come Lord Jesus, we pray in your name. Amen. Let's stand together, friends, and sing Onward, Christian Soldiers.
You know how we wage war. We wage war on our knees. We wage warfare through our worship. We turn the other cheek. We pray for those who hate us. We love those who persecute us, just like Jesus did. Just like Jesus did. And when those times come, the grace of God will fall upon you to do just that. You don't have that grace ahead of time. You have it only when you need it. The priest stepped into the, red, the, the, the Jordan River and then the water stopped, right? They had to take that first step of faith and the water stopped. So much of our life is like that. The grace comes right when we take that step of faith. So go in peace. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord, the Lord lift up his countenance upon you, my friends. May he give you his peace. Amen. Amen.